fun thing. So Tash, what's the one thing you want people challenged by pain to know about? I think it's the remarkable changeability and adaptability that systems have. Because I think there's, you know, we're, we almost fall into this mindset of thinking that once pain has been there for a while, that means nothing else uh, of me change. And I think what is the research shows quite strongly is that our systems, first of all, they're dynamic. They're always updating based on the available information for that person um, in that environment, in the society that they're in. And often those updates, they can be largely driven by things that you do, things that you have control over and things that, that I think we might not always consider are related to something like pain. And I guess where I get really excited is when we start to understand that pain is a really complex phenomenon because I think it's, it's really tempting to think in terms of simplicity, such as, you know, I've got this that's chronic knee pain and all I need to do is cut out the wrecked or damaged areas of my knee and I'd be totally fine. But problematically is we often see that that's it's not that simple. We have you know, cases where people who have osteoarthritis and they've had a, a knee replacement and they actually still have quite severe pain. And luckily that's not too many people, but the fact that that's still occurring, it, it helps give and build this evidence base that things are more complex. But that might sound like a bad thing. <laughs> like, wait, what? it's not simple, it's more complex. But I actually think it's a really good thing because, you know, if we embrace this complexity of an experience, what it means is that there's so many different things that are contributing to it. And if there are so many different things that are contributing to it, that's so many different targets. That's so many different things that we can do and we can try that may well make you know, a real impact, certainly upon our function, but also on, I think, pain itself. And I guess where, where I see this as being really relevant is, so in order for things to update and to change, it needs to have a stimulus. There has to be something there that is, you know, forcing, not forcing, but enabling and, and pushing and promoting that adaptation. And that's where I think some of the, the things that we already have are really powerful. Because you think like things, I would even just say, you know, things like knowledge and education. When, like thoughts, our, our nerve impulses too in our head. So even when we have these thoughts and these beliefs, as we learn and as we start to understand more, I think not only can it sometimes help people explain why they might have really weird symptoms, like why something hurts way more yesterday or today than yesterday and I didn't even do anything different. And that might be explained by some of these biological processes that we understand. But it's, it's also just that our having that understanding can also then help us move forward and shape what we do. And I'm always intrigued by illusions, visual illusions and, and how our system works um, and how we create the perceptions that we have. And one of the coolest things, it's actually a video right now on um, TikTok and it's showing, it gives this sound. And if you read the words green light, you hear green light being said. And if you read, I think it's brainstorm, you hear brainstorm being said. And what I think is so powerful about that is then it's giving us an overt example that what we perceive is actually shaped by our expectations and the things that have occurred to us, our experiences right before we've experienced that. And so it also raises the possibility that, you know, our strong beliefs can very much shape what we experience. And so to me, that's just fascinating because it, it means that the more I think we understand about how pain works, the ability for us to engage with the environment and also for that to shape our experiences is really large. And that's where I get excited. Cool. So, I mean, if all of these different potential stimuli are there, how do we find the right ones to start to change the way people perceive their pain experience? Yeah, it's a really good question. And I think it comes down to, you know, working with a trusted 
health professional to work through some of those things. So because I would argue that we really do need to do nuanced assessments, both talking to people and working with them, you know, objectively to see how they move, how, um, how they approach different problems, because it's not a one size fits all. And what might be, for example, really contributing to, for some people might not matter as much for others. And, and I think we see this, um, particularly when we see um, people that might feel quite anxious or fearful of, of different movements. And they often, it's a very valid emotion. It's exactly how they should feel based on an understanding of, let's say, you know, I saw a scan of my back and I saw a big bulging disc. And so I'm pretty much picturing when I'm bending over lifting something heavy, that's a lot of pressure on that big bulging disc. And I think then understanding for that specific person, what needs to be gone uh, reviewed or what needs to be discussed, that allows it to become a lot more nuanced. And I think some of the things that more generally tend to have support um, are things like exercise, where specific to that person, helping to get them moving, not only has, you know, excellent cardiovascular, um, so heart health, lung health, um, general mortality health effects, but it also can really, um, you know, promote self-confidence in ability to move. It can help, you know, get that, uh, that ha habit or pattern back into place and even improve function just by getting people back into doing things. So I, I think it does require nuance, but it does mean that it can be trial and error. It can be seen, does this have a meaningful impact for me? And if it doesn't, then we can work, I think, with health professionals, almost as pain coaches, to help take us to that next level. Yeah, it seems like you could almost use some of these illusions, which that's potentially a, a dangerous thing to, to discuss with a patient. Oh, look, this, see this illusion. It's all sort of smoke and mirrors. But maybe to use these illusions of perception as, as a way to find some of those nuanced things that, that you may be able to use those in such a way as to shift that perception to go, look, this is how this works. And, and what's happening is you're predicting it. And that could change things. Do you think that's an avenue or? I, I like that. I think you, you hit the nail on the head that it, we have to be careful with how we present that because the very last thing that we want some people to come away with or to feel is that we're saying that their experience isn't real. It's all in their head being made up there. And I mean, we would maybe argue it kind of might be, <laughs> that's how we experience any emotion or, or perception or feeling. Um, but that's not what we're saying. We're saying it's a very real experience, but that the brain is a constant learning machine. Our systems in general are, are constantly learning. And what they're then trying to do is, as we give different available information, that allows things to shift and um, inherently uh, allows systems to learn. And so thinking about what sort of information we put in can also then maybe dictate on how that system learns over time. Um, coming back to the idea of how we might um, input or use things like visual illusions, I guess I could see potentially things like the rubber hand illusion, for example, as kind of a cool way. So, you know, stroking uh, a fake hand and their real hidden hand at the same time, so it feels like it's theirs, um, but using a rubber hand illusion to show that, um, actually sometimes when you get sensory information that's coming at the same time, your, your brain adapts to that right away. And it starts to then almost make it feel like that's your hand and you're feeling touch on that. And that if something was to come and attack that hand, you would defend it, you'd try to pull back. And it's, it's just showing that that's direct evidence of your system learning. Yeah. And so if we can use that, that, that's cool if we can use that in the, in the realm of, of pain. Yeah, that, that, and that's actually real, right? That it's actually a real thing. That's that, right. Um, it, that, that occurs, even though it's an illusion, but it's still real, it's real to the person. That's right, because I think it's, it's differentiating, differentiating between the fact that what you're doing is a trick, but the experience itself isn't. Yeah. yeah. It is an update. It's real. Exactly. Sure. <laughs> Very cool. Well, thanks so much for your time. We really appreciate it. I look forward to getting this out there. Sounds good. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, Dave if anyone comes to my door. <laughs> <laughs>